what I'm going to describe today are three things. So uh, to, to record this, do you need to dim the light? Or I guess, yeah, I just switch that off. So three things, basically. One is, what is cleanliness? Why should we worry about it? And how? Second thing is cleaning procedures, <clears throat> various cleans and some general ideas of cleanliness. And then the lab policies, uh, uh, both about the people as well as the equipment and the wafers. So those are the three things uh, I'll cover. <clears throat> Why should we care? Why should you care? Okay. So chemical contamination can ruin the device and circuit performance, the reliability of the devices, and most importantly, process and equipment controllability and reliability. And in the lab, we have one of a kind of each equipment. And if you are not careful, you screw up the equipment, well, everybody gets hurt. Uh, particulates. The contamination which may be floating around in the air or generated by the equipment can impact the device and circuit yield and uh, process uh, repeatability. So contamination affects not only your research but everybody else's research. So now there are some device issues for example. I'll go to device issues, circuit issues, uh, equipment issues, etc. So, uh, for example, this is a very simplified version of the cross-section <laughs> of a MOSFET. Uh, and these, so this is the gate, this is the gate oxide, source, drain, and channel here. And these red circles are presumed to be contaminants. So, for example, within the oxide, uh, the contaminant can act as a trap or as a charge. You know that from your uh, various device and uh, processing courses. Contaminants in the semiconductor can also act as a trap, can degrade the lifetime and the mobility in the channel. So specifically, the performance degradation can impact the gate oxide quality, the carrier lifetime in the case of a, a semiconductor, MOSFET uh, threshold voltage shift, and uh, the device performance. Specifically, if you look at this case here on the right side, Drain current is plotted as a function of gate voltage, and there are two curves. The blue curve is for high trap density, and the red curve is for low trap density. And you clearly see two things. The high trap density has reduced the on current, it has increased the off current, and it has shifted the threshold voltage. So these are actual experimental results. And that's why you should uh, worry about uh, uh, the contaminants. These, these, these were the contaminants within the wafer. So device issues in terms of reliability. So in the same device, if there are contaminants in the gate oxide, they can, uh, in the worst case, they will cause oxide breakdown or premature breakdown. In, in a slightly better case, they can change the lifetime. So, so this was an experiment done at IBM where, where the wafers were exposed to various uh, environments. Uh, and then large number of devices were measured and cumulative failure is plotted as a function of charge to breakdown. You push the charge through the transistor and after a certain amount of charge is passed through the gate, it breaks down. And that parameter is known as QBD, or charge to breakdown. So the only thing I want to point out is these are three somewhat safer environments. In your notes, I think there's a mistake. An arrow is shown and whatnot. Ignore that. So uh, uh, these two are stored in vacuum. This, this one is stored in a box, and in one case, oxidation is done and then waiting for polysilicon. In the other case, uh, here just the wafer is sitting. But this last case, you put uh, a monolayer of this chemical known as HMDS and then leave it. And, and before that, you have done the gate oxidation. 
and then before you deposit polysilicon, you try to clean it and then do deposit polysilicon. And that's the worst case. It gives very large devices with very low QBD. So the idea is to show that the contaminants which were present in HMDS, uh, gate oxide is the, is the most sensitive thing in your device. And you have contaminated that, nothing you can do to recover it. Uh, similarly, a circuit issue. So what is shown here is uh, metal lines which are blown up from this part of this chip. And these metal lines are supposed to be distinct. So you will be testing them eventually uh, once you uh, finish the processing. These two blobs here, supposing a big particle somehow fell before you did the etching, well, that particle will act like the photoresist, and the metal didn't get etched here and here, and you have shorts. So yield degradation, single defect can ruin the entire circuit. Even if it doesn't ruin the entire circuit, maybe the performance gets degraded. Uh, the line may be thinner someplace, having more resistance, or the capacitance changes, or some such thing. So uh, circuit uh, can also be degraded. MEMS issues. People who are working on MEMS think that MEMS are such huge devices, so they are immune to all these problems. Not, not so. In fact, MEMS are uh, sometimes even uh, more important uh, to, uh, to worry about contamination. One example is supposing you are etching a cavity and you want this overhang, and this may be uh, a device as a pressure sensor, it may be in your uh, digital uh, projectors. This may be uh, uh, the thing which goes up and down and, and uh, uh, reflects the light. Supposing you have this little thing uh, present here as a contaminant, somehow it came. Now you're supposed to have removed all this oxide. You did not remove. So now this overhang is permanently stuck. Now, if it is uh, uh, one of the pixels in uh, your digital projector, that pixel is stuck, so it, it will either show always black or always uh, uh, white. And there are millions of pixels in today's uh, high-definition de cameras or high-definition projectors. So one little thing can ruin the performance. So prevention, first of all, personal cleanliness, so pre-suiting procedures. When you enter the lab, what should you be doing? Okay, so wash your face and hands before you enter the lab. Use lots of water, okay, uh, to make sure. Your body is not really that clean as you think. It is, it is emitting lots of particles. So if those particles uh, are on your uh, face and hands, try to remove them. Uh, if you eat anything prior to entering the lab, drink water and rinse your mouth because uh, that, that food uh, is also uh, a source of particles. Now, smoking. First of all, don't smoke at all. <laughs> it's bad for your health. <laughs> if you do, then uh, drink lots of water to, to wash out uh, the particles caused by uh, the, 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 the cigarette. This is winter quarter, it will rain. It is gonna rain heavily uh, tomorrow, it's in the forecast. So the, if you have muddy shoes, somehow clean them before entering. Don't bring the mud to the lab. Uh, now you have been already told about the procedure that the first thing to cover is your hands because you might want to touch everything else with the hands. Those gloves are cleaner than your hands. Uh, so personal habits and hygiene continues, gowning, so you have been given the gowning procedure, uh, follow that. Now if you were to uh, start using the lab uh, regularly, then don't keep the same uh, bunny suit forever, please change it regularly. <laughs> Another important thing is bringing in the materials. Any new material which you bring to the lab. Uh, should be cleared by this uh, committee, SPICMET. So, for example, you may start working on a uh, flat panel display project. 
this is a shared lab. Uh, not everybody is working on MOSFETs. And uh, many of the flat panel displays are made on glass. And glass contains sodium. Get it cleared by the lab that where it can go and where it cannot. And I'll come back to that uh, more a little later. So there are all sorts of new materials being researched in uh, various domains. Make sure that those materials are compatible with the equipment. And more on that a little later. Uh, lab behavior. Use appropriate handling tools, not fingers. I think you have already been told that in the uh, lab. The movements, the more quickly you move, you stir the air. And if you stir that from the ground, the particles can come up and get deposited. Uh, it's a winter time. Many of you may catch cold and whatnot. So if you cough and sneeze, and the wafer is lying there, please. <laughs> move away from the wafer and pr preferably closer to the floor and then cough and sneeze. Uh, avoid touching face and unprotected skin with your uh, gloves uh, to itch or something. You know, you, you maybe use some other part of your uh, hand or uh, something. You, you uh, itch your face and then touch something while well, you have contaminated the wafer. Those of you who are late, these things will be available online. Uh, next week. So view the first part uh, uh, before you go for your respective uh, groups. And I'll send you an email to give you the link. Way for handling. Poor handling practices are the primary cause of uh, wafer defects. So what, what are we talking, uh, talking about? The tweezers. Use appropriate tweezers. You have plastic tweezers. You have uh, uh, metal tweezers which are coated and in general although not in your case in general there are three or four different types of uh, tweezers for uh, various cleaning levels so if you start using the lab regularly you will be required to uh, use those transferring wafers uh, i think your ta will show you f from one cassette to other you just roll them to avoid uh, too much handling uh, because too much handling causes all sorts of defects also. Uh, when you load and unload the wafers, watch your TA. When you are uh, uh, unloading, you do back to front and front to back load. Uh, so those are again to minimize uh, the contamination. Okay, in a little more detail then. Uh, the surface issues. So what are the types of contaminants we are looking at? And what are the surfaces, or sorry, what are the sources and what are the effects? So for example, organics, skin oils, mostly from your body. Resist is not really a very clean material. It does have all sorts of contaminants. And polymers, which may be either your boxes or may be generated during plasma etching and so on. Uh, the sources are room air, storage boxes, and the residue from resist. I just said that. Effects are oxidation rates will change, interface properties will change, uh, interface could be the contact resistance of a device, interface could be just the, the, the interface states, etc. Metals, those are the biggest killers. Alkali ions, heavy and transition metals. Uh, they may be present in your incoming wafers, so you have to make sure the quality of the incoming wafer is good. Uh, they may be present in chemicals, plasma etchers are made with metal, uh, or other equipment can also give rise to metal contaminants. If you don't remove the metal contaminants, it Im uh, impacts the breakdown field, leakage, oxidation rates, interface properties, carrier lifetime, etc. So these are among the biggest killers. Native oxide. If you just take a germanium wafer and, and just move around, it grows 10 angstroms. Silicon, maybe 4 or 5 angstroms. Uh, the DI water dryer or even chemicals, they grow. So it is best to remove uh, the native oxide before doing ultra clean processing. For example, gate oxide, you might want to remove that. Uh, let me make it clear. Before growing gate oxide, if native oxide is present because of some other operation, 
remove that and then grow gate oxide. Otherwise, uh, for example, some of you may have come across uh, the use of high dielectric constant materials as gate dielectric for scaling the MOSFET to, to future generations. If uh, interface oxide is present, then it uh, reduces the dielectric constant. Uh, that, that's the, one of the future implications of uh, native oxide. Otherwise, it does have all sorts of, uh, uh, it could have all sorts of impact. Micro roughness. So if, when you look at the mobility of transistors at high field, the carrier mobility is limited by the surface roughness. This was taught to you in E216, and if not, uh, any, any of the other courses. That roughness comes during uh, various uh, cleans, etching, etc. And it impacts the breakdown field, leakage, and mobility. So one has to be careful. So for example, whatever cleans you are using for silicon, if you use for germanium also, they etch germanium very fast and causes lots of micro roughness. So you have to use different cleans for germanium. So metals are among the worst. So this is just an example that a wafer was subjected to various uh, processing steps and then the uh, metals were uh, detected by various uh, techniques. So this is the concentration of the remaining metal and this is the, uh, the processing step. Uh, and the three metals looked here were iron, nickel, and copper. And the reason is, in this table, for various elements, uh, the electron negativity is shown. And higher the electron neg negativity, easier it is for them to get deposited on the wafer. And these are the three most common ones which can get deposited, partly because these are the materials present in your equipment. Uh, so, oxidation, now, this is the level which can be detected by the techniques which uh, were used here. So this is the level which is uh, 10 to the 10, you can assume there is no contaminant. So oxidation furnaces are quite safe. But look at ashing, dry ashing, iron implantation, iron implantation is the worst because your ions are uh, getting accelerated and the lenses are focusing ions into a fine beam and lenses are made of metal. So these ions are energetic and they sputter off uh, material from the lenses and that's what you are getting. So that's why before any ion, ion implantation is never done in bare silicon. You always have a thin dielectric layer or thin sacrificial layer and through that you do ion implantation and remove that layer. You might ask, Gee, why was it used uh, as a sac sacrificial layer? This is the reason. Uh, so in general, the sources are equipment, processes, materials, and, uh, and the humans. And the transition metals uh, on silicon surface are the, are the most critical. So that brings us to the, the second part, needs from the wet clean. They need to remove organics particles, metals and ions, and native oxide. And I'll talk about passivation of the surface also. We need to dry the surface before doing any processing without roughening or contaminating the surface. I gave you the germanium example. So there are variety of, uh, so in this case, we are talking only about silicon. But those of you who eventually get in the PhD program and start using the lab, and use three, five materials or germanium or any other material, should be very careful not to use silicon cleans for those materials. Okay, so post lithography rinse we need to uh, look at resist strip, and that would be for a clean substrate or a metal bearing substrate, even in the clean. Uh, following simple edge, for hardened resist, for sidewall removal, etc. So, so I will go in more details of these uh, subcategories. Similarly, metal bearing following simple edge and hardened resist. Uh, what is hardened resist? When you iron implant, 
you give lots of energy to the resist it, and because of that energy it cross links and becomes very hard like a plastic anyway standard pre-diffusion furnace clean to clean the substrate before either doing oxidation uh, or uh, diffusion and pre-deposition means the CVD before doing any of the CVD steps and then decontamination cleans the wafer is uh, has a gross amount of uh, contamination for example KOH etching for some of the MAMS activities how do you remove it post lithography rinse wafer undergoing dry etch following uh, uh, photolithography may need to be rinsed prior to processing the rinse will remove residual chemicals which may remain after the develop the residual developer can corrode substrate films and surface uh, coming into contact with wafers the best example of that is aluminum etching when you do aluminum etching uh, byproducts sometimes are not as volatile they stay there you need to remove them uh, or sometimes the polymer gets deposited on the side walls that's how you get purely vertical walls so you need to uh, remove those things so now let's get into specifics you have already used some of them in your first week but let's look at the details so first one is a combination of sulfuric acid and peroxide uh, hydrogen peroxide known as piranha it is so potent so it, it is named after the piranha fish <laughs> Uh, so piranha is a heated boiling mixture of uh, sulfuric acid and hydrogen peroxide this is a very strong oxidizing uh, uh, mixture and what it does is that uh, sulfuric acid reduces the organics to carbon and hydrogen peroxide uh, oxidizes the carbon to form carbon dioxide and that goes away this will also react with metals so it will remove many of the metals. Uh, for metals will form sulfates, and sulfates generally are soluble in water. Uh, so mostly it is used for removing organics, but also removing gross particles, etc. Uh, before uh, and is used as a part of the pre-furnace or pre-deposition clean. It will consume metals, so uh, cannot be used after the metallization has been done and we'll come back to that a uh, little later one important thing about this is hydrogen peroxide evaporates very rapidly so if you mix it you can't really use it forever it needs to be refreshed in your case it's the responsibility of your TA but when you go in the PhD program and start using the lab you have to be careful when was it mixed last time Again, you can go to the staff and uh, uh, get help in, in, in that case. Uh, metallic and alkali uh, clean. So we use a mixture of water, hydrogen peroxide, and hydrochloric acid. In general, hydrochloric acid is much cleaner than sulfuric acid. Uh, so that. Uh, clean remove the metallic and uh, alkali ions the hydrogen peroxide oxidizes the surface both metals and hydrocarbons and HCl reacts with most metals to form very soluble chloride and they are uh, removed uh, but it does leave a chemical oxide on the silicon surface so remember that we will come back to that later if you have any questions just interject me uh, now I just said that it leaves a thin layer of oxide so generally that native oxide is removed in hydrofluoric acid uh, sometimes the hydrofluoric acid is mixed with ammonium fluoride uh, and it's called buffered oxide etch uh, now this also attacks uh, the metal so ca cannot be used once the metal has been deposited but the last native oxide can be removed using uh, this Passivation of surface. So, supposing you have cleaned everything, uh, let's say you used last part as hydrofluoric acid or maybe ammonium fluoride or even hydrogen 
uh, uh, HI is uh, iodic acid. So what happens is, at least in these two cases, the fluorine atoms uh, well, no, fl no, fluorine is for etching. The hydrogen from these goes and attaches to the dangling bonds. If you didn't do that and take out the wafer, dry it, then these dangling bonds are very reactive and anything which is in the environment will attach to them. Hmm. But because the last part contains <coughs> hydrogen, if that hydrogen is attached to the wafer surface, then it's passivated, and chances are even in a relatively not so clean air environment, you can uh, move the wafer and it will be relatively safer. Okay? Uh, so this is used very effectively to terminate the surface before loading them in a, a processing equipment. Uh, uh, this can last actually for hours, except if there is uh, uh, either ozone or ultraviolet in the uh, environment, then it uh, breaks this bond. So UV could come from these fluorescent lights, although I'm assuming no UV comes from these, but in old days it did. Ozone could be generated by any of your plasma etching uh, uh, equipment. So one has to be careful. Chances are you don't have any of this in uh, SNF, but other places could have that. So resist strip. For non-metal bearing wafers, uh, first thing to worry about is resist hardening. So as I said earlier, especially during ion implantation and even in plasma etching, during plasma etching you are bombarding the surface with highly energetic ions. Same thing in ion implantation. So that energy starts cross-linking various molecules and it becomes very hard. Uh, uh, so, f uh, you need to worry about that, okay? For, to begin with, if it is non-hardened photoresist, then you can use uh, the, uh, this uh, uh, 20 minutes of immersion in 10 to 1 ratio sulfuric acid and hydrogen peroxide, the so-called piranha, will remove most of the resist. For hardened resist, you first need to go to plasma uh, oxygen, which reacts uh, with this hardened resist, removes it, and then go to the piranha. Uh, many of the plasma etching steps, for example, aluminum etching, or many of you work on uh, MEMS kind of devices, and the side walls get very heavily coated with polymer to get deep uh, trench etching. In that case, you need to worry about uh, removing the polymers or aluminum byproducts. Uh, so you need to, again, use plasma and the piranha. And after doing that, don't be sure that it got removed. You need to inspect it. And if it didn't get inspected, then you need to go back and do it again. Uh, that's one of the biggest mistakes people do, that they assume it's gone, and in some cases it's not gone. Uh, so, with metal bearing uh, wafers, remember that piranha, etc., will attack the metal very quickly. So, you can't use. Uh, so, piranha cannot be used, but this thing, PRX, PRX 127, is a commercially. This, so, this is a code name, doesn't mean anything. It's, uh, uh, it's a code name of a company, is a commercial chemical for stripping resist. Uh, it's partially a solvent and partly a base. One thing to worry about, introduction of water can cause uh, corrosion. So your wafer should be totally dry before you subject to piranha. So for non-hardened uh, resist, you simply use PRX-127 and remove it. For hardened resist, you need to go to plasma and then with P uh, PRX. Again, inspect your wafers just to make sure they are gone. So I've been talking about that post-plasma etch, you need to remove the byproducts. So there are various scenarios. If you used a polysilicon or silicon etch using a bromine or chlorine chemistry, then just HF, uh, dilute HF uh, is sufficient. Oxide etch, 
does generate lots of uh, polymers, so you need to go to polymer clean process using plasma. Uh, uh, STS is a piece of equipment which is used for deep trench etching. So there you uh, generate lots of polymer and therefore you need to go to oxygen plasma. Aluminum etch is a special thing there. So uh, before you take out the wafer, you need to go through uh, a, 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 a slight uh, plasma environment in uh, one of the plasma may not be AMT, could be anything else, but uh, the important thing is in a, in a particular uh, plasma environment followed by PRX-127. So now comes the more important part that uh, when you have your wafers, you did lithography, you did the etch, and now you want to do either oxidation or uh, diffusion. So we call them all pre-diffusion. Uh, so before, uh, your next thing is gate oxidation, right? Next week is gate oxidation, I believe. Uh, by the way, the process, the three-page or four-page process flow which I had uploaded uh, had uh, some problems. So I have replaced it, so please download it again. Some numbers had been changed which didn't show up. They were changed using Adobe Acrobat, and I thought that shows up when you read it, but it doesn't. So I uh, read it, did it, please download it again, throw away the old ones. Anyway, so we use a combination of several steps to make sure everything is gone from the wafer before we do either diffusion or oxidation. So the first thing is to use the piranha. And, and that removes uh, residual organics and any gross particles, etc. Then you go and use 50 to 1 HF dip that in case native oxide was grown during uh, this cleanup, which may contain some junk, that goes away. Then you go to the, uh, this uh, mixture of hydrogen peroxide and HCl uh, to remove the metals and al uh, alkali and again strip uh, the native oxide and uh, that uh, is the total process. What is not shown here is that there are water rinses between each of these steps. So after this you rinse, then do this, then rinse, do this and so on. Uh, again these two contain hydrogen peroxide that needs to be replenished uh, regularly. The pre-deposition clean, before doing a deposition in a, uh, uh, let's say deposition of polysilicon, deposition of oxide, etc. Again, piranha followed by uh, the HCl and then 50 to 1 dip and in between, of course, uh, the rinses. Uh, it's more or less the same thing uh, as the pre-diffusion or pre-oxidation clean. Uh, so technically there is hardly any difference between those two. Now if you have metal present, so last step is metallization and etching etc. You can't use any of those, otherwise the metal will be etched away. So what you use is a, again a commercially available thing called PRS 1000 followed by a double rinse uh, etc. It's, uh, PRS 1000 is very similar to 127, it's a commercial uh, uh, solvent which removes uh, the photoresist, etc. Decontamination. So what do you mean by decontamination? Well, you know, supposing you are working on MEMS and you use KOH, it has potassium, that's a bad thing. Uh, Potassium works somewhat similar to sodium in terms of uh, movement of ions, etc. Whoops, sorry. I am a jazz lover. <laughs> uh, so the uh, so the, uh, the best example I gave you is KOH, but there are many other scenarios. You bring a wafer from outside, you don't know 
uh, let's say you gave wafers for an implantation, you don't know if it was clean and, uh, or not or so on. So you go through these three steps. You first use this uh, hydrogen peroxide HCl mixture, uh, process through standard Pirana resist strip at uh, uh, this particular bench, and then process through standard pre-diffusion or pre-deposition clean uh, at this particular bench. Cleaning vessels and carriers. So, uh, first of all, always use quartz or Teflon containers. There are containers made of Pyrex, for example, your Petri dishes, they are bad. They have lots of sodium. Uh, so don't ever use those unless you, have, you are totally finished with processing, you never intend to bring the wafer back in the lab, then it's up to you. But otherwise, quartz or Teflon. For uh, uh, HF, see HF etches quartz, so you can't use uh, uh, quartz, so you use uh, a Teflon. Uh, and particular type of uh, Teflon. Uh, now HF cannot go down the drain. It uh, screws up Mother Nature, so you have to, to recycle it. Uh, wafer samples and carriers, Teflon or quartz holders only. Wafers, much easier to clean than pieces. However, you may be working with a company which uh, takes a little piece and does laser annealing or something, and then you, are, you bring it back. So you, in that case, you will be using beakers. Otherwise, for full uh, wafers, you will be using cassettes. Use of cassettes gives you much more repeatable results. Uh, they are compatible with spin dryers, uh, but they do require large vessels and lots of chemicals. Uh, Non-cassettes, well, they're cheaper, smaller bath size, but you can't automate things. You literally use blow dry, things like that, so they're not as clean. Uh, okay. Rinsing. So rinsing is always done in quartz or clean plastic. Must be done long enough to remove all traces of uh, previous chemicals. Uh, uh, it is a good idea to use a pH meter or resistivi resistivity meter to test the outgoing water, uh, which indicates whether the chemicals are gone or not. Uh, if you are using beakers, then you need to manually dump uh, several times to each, uh, you know, fill the beaker, wash it, dump it, again fill, and so on, because there is no continuously flowing water. Uh, re and re results in that case will vary with the user. You just have to be super careful. Uh, in the case of rinsing using uh, proper uh, vessels, there's always upflow of water. It takes all the impurities, takes them out. Uh, it's a big improvement over beakers. I think this was probably taught to you in E212. So, uh, Dump rinser is much faster and more effective, but much higher cost. Beakers are cheaper, so, uh, but I think in this course you will not be using beakers. You will be using all uh, full wafers, uh, cassettes, etc. Drying. Simplest drying is blow drying. There is house nitrogen, there is a gun. You can uh, uh, do that. It's the simplest and lowest cost. It does need point of use filters on the nitrogen gun because nitrogen is stored somewhere, it's coming through the pipes, collecting all sorts of stuff. So one has to make sure that uh, it is clean at the point of use. Uh, you do need clean surface under the sample, clean wipes or filter paper. But the particles and wafer marks are a common problem. You are blowing uh, air, the air is going away from the wafer, is going on the table and may generate some particles which may come back and uh, deposit. People many times, uh, these are the two automated uh, procedures. You will be using spin dryers, but people also use isopropyl alcohol. Basically heat it, uh, put the uh, wafer in it and remove it and uh, uh, alcohol dries up very quickly. Uh, Spin dryers, basically you spin them and remove the water that way. 
It does require full wafers and cassettes, but it's very simplest to use, but is more expensive. We use it anyway. In every industry you will go, you will be using either a combination of these two or at least the spin dryers. They don't really use uh, blow drying <laughs> anyway. Storage. Uh, these are the three things you need to think about. Cassettes, storage boxes and ozone. Be careful about storing clean wafers. Cassettes can absorb chemicals and release them later. They're not really firewall to contaminants. Plastic boxes can outgas, causing an organic deposition. Lab air, uh, you know, there is a class in the lab, class 1000, class 100, class 10, and so on. What that means is that many particles in a cubic foot of air uh, of certain size. So it's not totally particle free. So lab air can cause uh, deposition of uh, contaminants. Uh, labs do have ozone, and ozone removes hydrogen passivation we talked about. So, so you can't really store for, you, d you did your clean, store it for uh, eight hours, and then come back and do oxidation. You cannot do that. So now comes maybe the most important part for this lab. We have a, a hierarchy of tools. This is a shared lab. People are uh, working on ultra clean uh, MOSFETs, but at the same time, people are working with uh, uh, different materials, etc. So we have three classes of equipment. Clean equipment, which is the most stringent uh, uh, category, is compatible with uh, CMOS processing, silicon CMOS processing, not even germanium, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, and the worst one is gold contaminated. So once a piece of equipment is gold contaminated, go gold, what does gold do? Gold has a trapping level right in the middle of the, the forbidden uh, gap. So it causes uh, severe degradation of uh, lifetime of minority carriers. So, but gold is used uh, quite a bit in a variety of uh, equipment, a variety of uh, devices. So. There is a class of equipment which is gold contaminated. It cannot be used for clean or something which is in between. Semi-clean is equipment which is still for clean devices, but things like uh, these metals, aluminum, tungsten, titanium, etc. And there are a variety of other materials which are reasonably good, but they are not as good as uh, uh, ultra clean. So there, these are the three classes of equipment. Substrates can go from clean to semi-clean to gold contaminated, but not in the reverse order. So that's the thing to, to remember. Uh, more on that, wafers run in semi-clean equipment are therefore considered semi-clean, even if there is no metal fill. So if you had, you were in a hurry, say, gee, I have to grow field oxide and you used a furnace which was meant for semi-clean, that you picked up, you cannot, you picked up some contamination from uh, the semi-clean equipment. You cannot go back now to uh, the clean equipment, okay? Likewise, the wafers run in gold contaminated equipment, even if they don't have any gold, cannot go to the other two. A good example, maybe you want to grow uh, plasma oxide. And I think till recently we did not have uh, plasma CVD for clean, uh, only for gold contamination. Uh, so, well, uh, if you did that, you can't go back to clean equipment or semi-clean. Some of the equipment belongs to all uh, categories. For example, lithography. I mean, say we can't have three steppers for each category and lithography is done at room temperature so even if you pick some of the uh, contaminants you are uh, going to clean it uh, and we are making we are going in a direction where we are uh, reducing the number of super clean equipment and in increasing the semi-clean because future research is more about 
uh, futuristic materials and futuristic structures. So we are trying to open up the lab. Uh, now, sometimes you can get away by doing decontamination. For example, after KOH etching to remove potassium, uh, you should be able to make it clean. But if you, are, if you have any doubt, just go to this particular committee and uh, they will tell you what can be done, what cannot be done. So there are policies set up in the lab. This is not really etched in stone, but this is an example. Uh, first of all, you need to figure out what kind of material you have. Is it a standard or maybe non-standard, perhaps as gold? So if it has, if the material is clean, then you go this path. If it is uh, either non-standard or gold contaminated, then you go to this path. Uh, you cannot use any mainline equipment except for photolithography, etc. So in each case, I'm not going to th go through the entire uh, figure, but you please take a look at it and find out at each step whether it's yes or no. If you have resist to other organics, it can go only in dirty equipment unless you clean it. If you clean it, then you go through this path and so on. So if you look at this kind of uh, uh, flow and reason, then you will never make a mistake. Uh, more on this particular in the next slide. Cleans must be done within one hour of uh, the uh, next step if it is a clean step. So for example, uh, you are going to grow gate oxide. And let's say cleaning was done at 8 a.m. and the wafers were sitting for two hours. You will not be allowed, you should not. Nobody is going to watch you, but you should not grow gate oxide for your own sake. So one hour is the limit before you uh, load them. However, the wafers can move between equipment of equal cleanliness if the interval is less than one hour. And wafers are in a clean Teflon cassette, not plastic. A good example is you grow gate oxide. The next step is uh, polysilicon deposition. So immediately take them over and uh, do that. Uh, so lab policy about equipment and wafers, no wafers of unknown or inappropriate history are allowed. So you take them outside and say, gee, I am using titanium and I'm going to get it deposited outside. You need to know this, uh, this particular sputtering machine, was it also depositing lead and copper and gold? If it was, your wafers are contaminated. They can't even go in semi-clean equipment. Uh, so for all these new materials, etc., you need to go to this particular uh, committee and get them uh, to tell you what to do. New includes not only materials that have not uh, been used in the lab before, but also standard materials or chemicals from an unproven source. I just uh, give you the example of that. Uh, or standard materials or chemicals used in a novel way. Don't shortcut this. Last year, there was this guy who was working on uh, some non-standard devices without realizing uh, that his wafers were uh, made of quartz, uh, sorry, uh, glass. And he didn't even know the glass is sodium. He put those wafers, assuming they were clean quartz, in an oxidation furnace. And then he did the rest of the processing. I think it was maybe two or three years ago or last year. Entire lab had to be decontaminated. It stopped uh, processing for several days or weeks maybe. I don't remember anymore. But that was a catastrophe. So don't do those kind of things. So take home message. Don't allow bad habits to propagate. Be conscious about your own habits and don't be shy about correcting other people. If you are doing processing and you see him screwing up something, check him, even though he may be senior to you. Or he may be a faculty member. Tell him, hey, you are doing something wrong because eventually you will suffer. Okay? <laughs> uh, we all make mistakes. 
So if you have made a mistake, if you put that glass wafer and realized it, don't try to hide it because it will propagate. Make sure you catch somebody from the staff and get it checked right at that moment. He may also ask questions. <laughs> so always ask questions. If you have any doubts, uh, the more you consult, the easier it will be uh, to be successful in the lab. Again, it's a shared facility, only one of a kind of each equipment. All it takes is to bring down one equipment so the entire lab uh, sort of stops because uh, things have to flow uh, continuously. So that's the take home message. Uh, any questions? Okay, so next, next week I'll give a talk on uh, process modeling using Supreme. Uh, and I'll again remind you uh, right here. So try to attend that one because that will tell you how to do simulation for your uh, midterm paper. <laughs>